I'm Nancy Ryans. I grew up on a small family farm out in the middle of cornfields, very northwest part of Chicago. I was a very weird kid. I was very spiritual. I looked around and saw that divine presence everywhere. I would tell my family, oh my gosh, God's in the trees. Spirit is all around us. They kind of looked at me funny because we were Catholics. And my family was pretty, pretty Catholic. They weren't just cafeteria Catholics or they weren't just weekend Catholics. When I was about 15, we started having a lot of those news reports about priests who were abusing kids that were really becoming prevalent, especially in the Chicago area. And that's when I actually began to question my previous viewpoint about, is there a God? You know, did, was I just imagining all of that? Uh, and so by the time I would say I was 16 or 17, I had pretty much decided that God didn't exist because if he did exist, how could this happen? And that cemented my movement away from religion or spirituality. I went into college and got a series of degrees in geology. So I became a really rational scientist, very material focused. By the time I was in my mid twenties, I was a pretty, uh, pretty firm atheist. After college, I worked for the Department of Energy for a while, doing very scientific things out in the Western United States. And it was mostly became scientific writing because I was actually quite good at writing and a lot of scientists weren't. So I would do editing for them for the journal articles they were writing or books they were writing. And that pretty much kept me through you know, the rest of my career up until my mid 40s. I was 46 years old. I had moved to Boulder, Colorado. I was beginning to feel a bit dissatisfied with where I was in life. Some things had not gone well. Um, my marriage had ended. And I was in that point of really questioning what was gonna come next for me. So I started looking for another job. I thought, you know, what I needed really was, was another job, a different job somewhere else, or, you know, maybe in Denver or something. A little bit later that month, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, I took a week off from work. So I went out for a bike ride, just do a little bike ride around town drop off some stuff at the library and run a couple of errands and then go out on a trail ride. I went into a traffic circle. The bike lane that I had coming in just completely went away and the, the roadway got really narrow. So I rode into it very cautiously and I kind of eased my way in noticing that there was some traffic coming in from my right, from the highway, into this traffic circle. And it looked like they were slowing down. At the last minute, that lead SUV, instead of stopping, she actually sped up. I was in a really bad spot because I was right there at where she was coming in. And all I could do, like, there was this instinctual response as I put my hand out. I have no idea what happened from the time I put my hand out till I ended up on the hood of her vehicle. So somehow I flipped up off the bike, up onto the hood of her vehicle, looking in at her, and she's texting. I'm actually trying to pound on her windshield and she, she kept driving. She didn't see me like, like literally right in front of her. And I couldn't hang on. I just, the, the hood of her vehicle was so slick. So I slipped down, desperately trying to grab onto something, but I couldn't find anything to grab onto. And I hit the pavement and I heard the crack of my helmet. And all of a sudden she was over the top of me. 
Somehow my backpack got caught on something underneath of her vehicle. And at the same time that happened, I reached up with my right hand and grabbed her axle. I don't know how long she technically dragged me. It was at least 60 feet. And what finally happened is that the guy that was in a truck behind her saw what was going on, was able to get around her, and he drove his truck around the traffic circle the wrong way and just stopped in front of her. So I kind of owe my life to this guy. As soon as she stopped, I started trying to wiggle my way out from underneath of the vehicle. But I got to the point where my shoulders were out from underneath the front of her vehicle. And at that point, a woman came up and she just said, I'm a nurse, just stay where you are. And I thought, what's the big deal? You know, I'm just gonna get up and walk away. And she said, no, you were just in a, you know, you're in a serious accident. I just need you to stay on the ground. So when the paramedics came, they, of course, were starting to try to figure out what was going on with me medically. And as soon as one of the, the guys touched the side of my neck, I just screamed at the top of my lungs. It was just so painful. And that's when I realized I was in pretty bad shape. So they brought me to the trauma center. I had a head injury. I had the cracked collarbone, five ribs that were broken in multiple places. I had a collapsed lung, but the main, the main damage was really to my neck and my back. The doctor basically said, well, every process in your back is cracked and you've got major damage to your neck vertebrae and then your lower back vertebrae. So they called in a surgeon who decided that he, he could fix it, he was gonna go in there, clean up all of the broken bits, and then put titanium rods up and down my back on either side of my spine. And that surgery was scheduled for the Monday after this accident, so like three days later. I had an unbelievable fear of death coming up to this. That was the biggest fear of my life, was the fear of death. I was absolutely mortified by that one fear. It paralyzed me in so many ways. So going into the surgery, I was really scared and almost had myself convinced that I wasn't gonna make it. They were wheeling me in. They got me moved onto the operating table. The anesthesiologist came up and, you know, as soon as he administered it, within like three seconds, I was, you know, drifting off. In a normal surgery that I've had, I've had a few before. It was just gray nothingness and then they were waking me up in the recovery room. This time I drifted off and I was even more awake than I was before the anesthesia. And it was that moment that I realized something really weird is going on here. I woke up and what I'm looking around at is this beautiful hillside. It's sort of like in a meadow, so there's low grass and flowers all around me. But I'm on the hillside looking out over a series of rolling mountain ranges. And I thought, well, this is kind of a cool hallucination. I could do this while I'm in surgery. The first thing I noticed was this wave of peace. It felt like, you know, standing in front of a fireplace when the fire is on and that heat kind of coming through you. It felt like I was being hugged. But there was this big moment of feeling acceptance and really just unconditional love coming into me. And um, it was powerful. And that's when I knew something was not right. 
and I thought, oh my God, I died. I thought I died. I remember being in surgery, and at that moment I felt love. I thought, I must have died on the operating table. The second thought, now here's my analytical science mind still kicking in. So wait a minute, if I died, what's all this? Because first of all, I don't believe in anything. Second of all, my parents told me that you're gonna go to hell because you're an atheist now. So I'm not experiencing either one of those. And that's when I really began to wonder what the heck was going on and why am I here? I asked that question in my mind, but then there was an answer to the thought I had. And the answer came kind of from around me in the atmosphere. And it was the answer of, this is your home. You are a part of me, you're a part of us. Welcome home. When it said that, welcome home, I lost it. Because I remembered. That's when it came back to me. And I knew immediately, oh my God. That life that I had on earth was just an illusion. That thing that I was doing down there on earth was really just a temporary state. And this is real. It just, it was like so obvious. I all of a sudden saw someone kind of materialize out of fog. And she was very ephemeral. So vaguely a human and she had what appeared to be long hair but I was never able to see her face because it wasn't about her it was about me learning what I needed to learn and that's what she said we, you know it's time for you to learn what you need to learn in order to go back and make your life one that would be worth living and those are pretty much her exact words and I'm like whoa I'm not going back there what are you kidding me I am not going back to that place. She said, well, you've already agreed to go back. And I said, I was kind of going back to my, my, younger, my younger self when I was kind of a pain to be around with my parents as I was always challenging them. So I was challenging her like, I, I don't want to go back there and I don't remember agreeing to go back. She said, well, you did that before you were born into your life, and so let me show you. And it was this weird movie moment where, like, in the air in front of me, sort of materialized almost like a movie screen. And she showed me me planning my life before I was born. So in a way, the experience was sort of planned out, and I got to see that. And there was a point at which I looked behind me and all that was behind me was fog. It was this foggy gray. Whereas in front of me, it was this really vibrant, maybe it was a forest or a canyon I was walking in or a mountain or something. But behind me, it was just gone. And I asked her about that. I was like, what's up with this? And she said, the place that you are in now is not the ultimate reality of where you're going to go. It's sort of a, she called it a holding place. And she said, in this place, it is your place of learning. And here, what we do is we're making this an environment that is comfortable for you to learn in. Things that you enjoy, places that make you feel comfortable and that will allow you to learn what you need to learn in order to go back and make your life one that's worth living. She would teach me things about not only the spiritual place I was in, but that everything was based on an energetic structure, not a physical one. Everything you see around you, it's an illusion. The more I thought about it, the more I knew it to be true. The equivalent amount of time that I was out on the operating table, because I did code, my blood pressure tanked, my heart rate stopped, 
The flatline part lasted at most about two minutes. If we were to do here what I did as far as places that I traveled and things I learned, it would take about two or three months here to do that. But it also seemed like forever there. You know, it was a completely different experience of, quote, time. What I realized from that is that it's not that time passes differently, it's that they are on the, at the spiritual level outside of our perception of time. I went to one place where I stood there and all around me, I saw the map of my life. It was like this virtual reality map, like an old timey, you know, nautical chart laid out all, all around me and I was at the center and there was this big, I think they call it a compass rose. And I'm looking all around it and there's these different pathways that I can see from one end of the map to the other. And I knew those were all of the different paths I had taken, or I should say could have taken up until this point. And then there were a lot of pathways kind of branching out from where I was, but all going back to the same place. And the point of that particular teaching was, first of all, we can take one of many paths in life and they pretty much bring us to the same place. So it's, it's not like there's a particular right path that you need to be on. The other part of that was, I noticed that Compass Rose was centered figuratively in my heart area. And the point of that teaching that she, she finally went into that is, you know, you don't just use your brain, your human brain to make decisions. You also have to dig deeper into what we would call intuition or that, that inner knowing. And she said, balance those two out so that you're making decisions from a really holistic place rather than simply an analytical decision. Up until that point in my life, I had completely ignored that. I didn't pay that any attention at all. After that, I had what people call a life review. Now, at the time, you have to understand, I didn't know any of these terms. I didn't know about NDEs. I didn't know about life reviews. I had no idea all of this stuff. So she brought me up this kind of meandering mountain valley into what looked like a pond up in the mountains. And she said, well, I want you to kneel down by the side of the pond and just touch the surface of the pond. So I just did it. And I just sat back on kind of on my heels and, and just watched the surface. The ripples going out, I could see on top of the ripples, there were small little pockets all across the surface of the pond that to me looked like little videos, vignettes of specific moments in my physical life. But when I would focus on one, I was back in it. I was, it wasn't like I was watching it from outside. I was back in it, experiencing it again from my perspective, but also experiencing it from the other people. And I could feel everything they felt as if it was mine. And that really got to me because there were times when I helped someone or said something nice and I could feel that person's, for want of a better term, I could feel their spirit soar. I could feel how buoyant they felt because someone said something kind. And then it also, I could see the, the downstream effects of those actions too. So if I said something positive and uplifting to someone, I in turn saw how that allowed them to be more positive with other people. So this teaching was, you have an impact on the people around you, not just physically, 
but there's also an energetic or spiritual component to every interaction that you have, whether it's a verbal interaction, whether it's there's something non-spoken, it doesn't matter. Everything that you do has an impact and therefore be more conscious of how you impact others. On the flip side, so it was balanced out for me to learn from with things that weren't so great that I did. There was a, a time when I was a teenager and my younger sister and I got into a fight. We fought like cats and dogs when I was a kid. We just did not see eye to eye. And I loved her, but we didn't get along very well. And there was one point when I was, I think I was probably like 17 and she was 14. I said something not so kind to her. And I didn't think anything of it at the time. It was just a way to get her off my back. You know, I just was, I was really tired of the fight we were having. So I just said something stupid and not very nice. And she didn't react. You know, I didn't see any reaction in the moment for her, except she left. But in my review, I could feel the hurt that I caused her in that moment. And this really, this is the, the second thing that always gets me. When I felt her pain at what I said to her, that was like biggest teaching moment ever. And that's the one thing I wish I could give to people was understanding viscerally how your impact affects, your, your actions affect someone else, your words affect someone else. And in that moment, I realized, whew, okay, I'm changing the way that I interact with people right now. Like, that's it. That, that point woke me up like nothing else. That was just this big aha moment. And ever since I've come back here, I remember that almost every day. And it helps me formulate how I interact with people every day. I'm very concerned and careful about how I interact with people. All of a sudden, for the first time in my whole, you know, experience there, I looked up and there were clouds in the sky. And we were just kind of looking around, you know, like when you were little kids, looking for animals up in the clouds. And so we did that for a while. And then she got up and she said, well, it's time for you to go now. I was not happy to hear that. I thought I was, I thought I had passed some kind of test, you know, and was gonna stay there. I was really planning on doing this end run around my teacher. I, had, I was like planning, can I just like run around her and just keep running until, until I find where I'm supposed to go. Um, that was one of the things that I wanted to do. And I, I also thought, well, if, if I pitch a fit enough, they'll just let me stay. I started getting a little bit weepy with her. So at that point, she laid hands on my shoulder that was broken, my ribs, and right up, like right up here, because the top of my sternum was the part that was cracked. And then she sort of sent me back. And I woke up in the recovery room. I was actually screaming when I woke up. I was yelling and I was not happy. I was really angry to be back. And the nurse who was helping me, she literally jumped back. But I kept yelling, where is she? Where is she? I don't want to be here. Can I go back? Can I go back? And they thought I was having some kind of psychotic episode, I'm sure. The anesthesiologist came in and talked to me a little bit. He got me calmed down. But I kept asking, I said, can you please send her back to me? Can you please send her back to me? And they had no idea who I'm talking about. I had a friend in the waiting room. So they went and got her and she, I feel so bad for her. So they brought her in and I said, that's not who I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't wanna see her. I wanna see the woman I was with during surgery. And they're like, 
what in the world is going on? So finally I realized, well, okay. Then my rational mind kicked in and I, you know, I remembered everything that happened, but I thought, okay, you need to shut up because they don't get it. They don't understand what you went through. So I just stopped talking. I was in a Lutheran hospital and the next morning, one of the chaplains stopped in for the hospital. She poked her head in like, you awake? And I, and I could tell who it was. And I said, oh, thank God you're here, <laughs> out loud. And she, she came in and we talked about what happened. She was amazing. She was really amazing. If she hadn't reacted in the, in the positive way that she had, I may never have told anybody ever again. But she was very accepting, very positive, and explained, you know, that I had died. And she said, well, you had a near-death experience. I'm like, what is that? She said, well, it's a thing. You know, people, people die and we bring them back and then they, they have these experiences. That was, that was the first time I ever heard of NDE. She helped me to understand it was normal. I'm not crazy. It was a real experience. And now, okay, now she said, now you need to start thinking about what this means for you. Because it's because I knew, and, and she was trying to get me to understand, but I knew that this could potentially blow my life open in a way that I would never have thought of before. It was a complete shift of what I thought was real, what I thought was true, uh, everything I believed. And I knew at that point it was like I had a choice. I could go back to the way things were. I could completely deny everything that had just happened. I could completely deny the experience itself, what I learned, and just try to go back to the way things were before. And that seemed, you know, somehow safe because it was predictable. Like I knew, I knew that path, I was on it. I didn't like it, but I was on it. But this other path was a complete unknown. If so, if I knew I could embrace what I learned and continue to learn from it, but I had no idea where that was going to go. And I, I really worried about what that would mean for my career because I was in, still in the sciences. I just assumed that I'd never be able to get a job again in the sciences because people would see that and she, oh she's crazy we're not going to hire her so i was really afraid of that path but about two weeks later when i came home from the hospital i realized well i'm going to give this new path a go i don't know where it's going to go i'll see what happens i was out of the body cast in just like a I think two days over four weeks. And they expected that to be 16. So it was very rapid, very rapid healing. What I started doing was I would go out in nature every day and meditate. That was one of the things I started doing that really helped, you know, kind of bring that soul level of awareness into my life. The second thing, and it's very, it sounds very simple, but it has a big impact, is really, truly learning how to be grateful. In the morning, I would start the day before I got up out of bed, I would be very grateful for just being able to walk, just basic stuff. I would allow myself almost to meditate on it, to really think about and feel, not just think, but also feel the gratitude for that, like, I could have been a paraplegic from that accident. I'm so grateful that I can walk right now. Just those simple acts of gratitude allowed me to focus on what was good in my life right now. And just little by little, those small things allowed me to stay more centered and present the rest of the day. 
It's about being aware of your actions in the moment without going on autopilot. It's so very easy to be living your life on autopilot, which is where I was before. So now I'm not hooked up into dramas like I used to be. Um, whatever goes on in our governments, it's like, yeah, it's going on, but I'm still at peace in my life. Concern? Yeah. I have concerns about the world, definitely. But it doesn't change this core of peace inside because I know it's important to be here in this reality. It has things to teach us. We all learn from it. But ultimately, we are not this reality. We're a bigger level of reality. I was learning really how to live from that soul level of awareness rather than just my limited human level of awareness. It's not that the human level of awareness was bad, but it, for me, it was very fear-filled and it was reacting to life rather than being proactive. And I didn't want to be that way anymore. And I wanted to live life from that level of that higher level of awareness because it felt better it was more peaceful it was more connected it was more love-filled and joyful it's a much better place to be uh, i'm not anywhere near as stressed out and certainly not fearful anymore you know it's been a really great change for me i'm not driven by this being a material world anymore. I'm not stuck on that. Um, I'm, I understand that there is a bigger picture, not just to the world, but to each one of us. That fear of death that I carried really kept me from fully living. At least for me, it kept me thinking small and safe. And that's not necessarily where all of us are meant to be at all times in our lives. There's, that's perfectly fine for some people. And, and at times in our lives, that's perfectly fine. But any decision based on fear, it's not to me the, most, the, the strongest decision that you can make. It's somehow limited. When I work with people individually, I really try to get people into that space where their, their decision-making is based on a place of strength and, and trust in themselves and, and maybe a place of compassion or love rather than, oh, I'm afraid that person won't like what I'm doing, so therefore I'm gonna do this, this thing instead of the thing I really wanna do. For the vast majority of souls that come here to have a life experience. And it's funny because my teacher calls this a near life experience. And so I just like to tell that to people. They consider this nearly life, but not real life. <laughs> so all of us who are here to have this near life experience, we come here for a variety of reasons. And, and some people, come here to learn a very specific thing. A lot of us come here to experience things that we can't experience anywhere else or that would be very difficult. Um, having a child, for example. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily give birth while you're in heaven. So a lot of people like to come here and experience having a family or raising a family. This physical reality it's like a crucible, meaning it's a very focused place where you can learn a lot of different things in a very short amount of time. And so the, the real challenge is narrowing down what it is that you want to learn while you're here. All those different reasons or purposes that people can have, there's one core. And that one core is to learn how to be here in this environment and still live from a place of love and compassion. Not just for your immediate family, but for everybody else. 
And that's the core purpose that we all share.